We're in a series of Exodus. Today is June 19th, uh, and it's uh, Juneteenth, and it's an opportunity to really just stop and acknowledge and mark uh, the emancipation of people here in the United States. Man, it's only been, we're only 150 years removed as insane as that is from uh from slavery here in the u.s and we're talking in a text in exodus one and two about a people who are oppressed and enslaved and the people and i'm going it's wild now it's it, you and i are the beneficiaries of context right so we're a little bit removed and my generation has to deal with less with it than my parents and their parents and their parents parents but um and we've come a long way we've come a long way which should be celebrated but there's always room for more there's always room for more growth and more healing and more restoration and more freedom and we serve a god who's all about deliverance and all about freedom and so we just want to stop and acknowledge that and celebrate where we've come as a country and uh for people who've gone through hard things and people who experience things different than we do because of the color of their skin or because of their background or because of their economy you name it um man we see you more importantly god sees you and um and so we just want to acknowledge that up front so uh and and we want to step into a text in the book of exodus we're going to continue in this series if you're new to our church family um that's where we're headed this morning and so uh so if you have your bibles go ahead and turn to exodus 6 that's where we're going to be um and if you if you've missed out uh, just kind of catch everybody up on where we've been so far. Uh, week one, we talked about the Israelites, the people of God, were in Egypt, and they were uh, they were uh, an oppressed people, an enslaved people, and it's been 400 years since they showed up on the scene. When they first got there, back in Genesis, there was about 70 of them, and now there's a couple million by the time we get to uh, Exodus 12, is what it tells us. There's six, over 600,000 men that are there in Egypt. And so, um, so because of, uh, because of their rate of multiplication, uh, Pharaoh looks out and he sees them as a potential threat, begins to, uh, oppress them and enslave them, put them on work projects, even mass genocide, uh, in Exodus one and two, he tells, he, there's this edict, Hey, kill all of the young Hebrew boys. And this is what Moses is born into. This is the environment that he's born into. And it's because of the obedience and the faithfulness of a handful of women is what we learned week one. Uh, there's some midwives, and there's Moses' mom, and Pharaoh's daughter, and all of them undermine the edict of Pharaoh in order to deliver the deliverer. And so Moses shows up on the scene because of the faithfulness and the obedience uh, of a group of women in Exodus 1 and 2. And then, um, and also what we learned in week one was that the people of God, they kind of came to the end of themselves. They were completely broken. End of chapter 2, they begin to cry out. And they're like, we... They just like, they're, they're like, there's no other way. Like we just begin to cry out. God hears their cries. And because of the covenant that he has with his people, uh, he's already set into motion the answer to their problem. And so week two, last week we talked about Moses is called. And so Moses who grows up, uh, again, mom puts him in a basket, rolls down the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter picks him up. Mom ends up nursing him. He's grown up. He's a prince of Egypt, grows up in the house of Pharaoh, and, uh, but comes to a place, realizes one day, I'm a Hebrew, sees his people oppressed, tries to step in, kills a brother, bad for business. He gets run out of town, right? So he's exiled out into the middle of the desert. He meets his wife, Sephora. And then 40 years, he's just chilling in the desert as a shepherd. And so now he's 80 years old when God meets him in the burning bush. And so last week, God calls Moses and Moses looks at God and gives him all the excuses, all the reasons why he is a terrible candidate to be the deliverer of his people. And he asks this question. Moses says, who am I? He's beginning, he talks about how he can't see stutters and hey, duh, if you remember, I killed a guy and like there's all these different things, the reason why he can't step into the assignment and he says who am i and then god answers and he's like who cares he's like i will be with you is what god says he doesn't even answer his question he's like no you don't understand uh i'm god and so um there's this he, there's this unpacking of who god is in this exchange with moses so he sent so moses he relents so moses asks this question he says hey if i go how do they how are they going to know that you sent me and god gives moses Three signs, if you remember. Uh, we didn't cover this last week. Just in your own reading, you need to spend some time in the text. And so God asked Moses, he says, what's in your hand? Like, what do you got? I can use anything. What's in your hand? And so he's holding a staff. And he says, lay the staff down. He lays it down, turns into a serpent. And he's like, pick it back up. That would have been hard for me. I ain't going to lie. I ain't going to lie. A lot of faith. 
Moe's got a lot of faith when he picks the snake. Anyway, so he picks it up by the tail and it turns back into a staff. And then he says, okay, now look at your hand. Put it inside of your cloak. He puts it inside of his cloak, pulls it back out. He has leprosy. It's all white. Again, as Moses, you're thinking, what is going on? This is a terrible uh, way to reveal that, you know, anyway. So God's like, hey, put it back in your coat, puts it back in, and now it's restored, it's healed again. And he sa- God says, hey, if neither one of those work, uh, and I love that he does that. He's like, look, as a caveat, like, if those don't work, try this. And then he's like, dip some water out of the Nile, pour it on the ground, it'll turn into blood. Crazy signs. Uh, and what's cool about that is God gives Moses these signs, not just for the Israelites, not just for Pharaoh. God gives these signs to Moses for Moses. And so Moses goes full of faith and courage. He's pumped, right? Uh, and he also, he's rolling with Aaron. And so he's got a little bit of a, uh, he's got a little bit of a crutch there. So he rolls up into Egypt, has Aaron, and he goes to the people of God first. He goes to the elders of the Israelites and when he goes to the elders, he shows them the signs, those three signs. And they begin, the Bible tells us they begin to worship. They just fall down and they're like, finally. Like, you know, they're thinking, this is it. This is the moment. Clearly God is using this man. He's going to speak through him, do great things. He goes to Pharaoh. And when Moses goes to Pharaoh, he says, hey, here's the thing. I need you to let God's people go. And Pharaoh's like, who? Who's God? And so he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know who you are. I don't know who your God is. Get out of my face. Matter of fact, instead of letting them go, I'm going to oppress them more. I'm going to beat them more. And now they're going to have to make bricks and I'm not going to supply what they need to do that. There's still quotas are going to have to be met. And so, um, so the Israelites get wind of this and they're like, what? And they go to Moses and they're like, what have you done? They begin to curse Moses. Like you moron, you've been in the desert for 40 years and you show up, you think you're going to do something cool for us. And anyway, so Moses goes to God, prays and says, Hey, uh, what's, what is the deal? You asked me to do this. Here's the response. The people hate me now, cussing me out. What do you want me to do? And then Exodus 6 is where we pick up. God speaks to Moses and he gives him four promises. He gives him four promises. And here's the cool thing about this passage that we're going to look at today. These promises are what God has given to his people since the beginning of time. In the New Testament, these show up in the commission, the great commission of Jesus. They show up all over the Bible, these four promises that God has for his people, but all the way back into Ex- Exodus 6. And so uh, that's where we're going to be. If you have your Bibles, um, you can turn there. But before we jump into that, I want to talk a little bit about promises in general. Um, because you and I, you know, we... We make promises, we try and keep promises, promises are broken. And the difference between us and God, the God that we serve, is he never he never breaks his promises, and his promises serve a purpose. This is second Peter one four. It says, Because of his glory and his excellence, God has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature. And they escape, and then and they enable you to escape the world's corruption caused by human desire. So Second Peter 1 tells us, hey, God's promises do two things. Helps you to become more like God and then avoid pain, suffering, corruption, sin, broken, hard things, right? It's, the more you become like him, the, the more you can avoid um, all of the corruption of the world. And so most of us as Christ followers, we're really, we're not, if you're being honest, we're not participating fully in the divine nature of Jesus. I don't know about you. Maybe you are uh, on a hundred percent. Okay. I'm operating at any given time. Not like, uh, just like Jesus, but God tells us, Hey, my promises will actually give you over to more. You actually become more like me. The more you grab hold of them, the more you know them, download them, the more you trust them, the more you become like me. And so uh, he's saying these promises have a transforming effect on our faith. When you actually apply the promises, they can transform you. So instead of you pretending to be one way on a Sunday and then going home and acting a different way, this happens every single week, and then going to work and acting one way, and then when you're around your buddies, you act one way, and when you're over here, what happens is the promises of God get on you and they have a transforming effect on your heart so that you become uh, who it is that God's called you to become. And you're consistent regardless of your environment. So you don't fear the people around you, you just begin to fear God. And so it just transforms you. That's what he wants for us by his promises. The other thing is we can escape the corruption of the world. And the world is corrupt because the world is broken. It's beautiful. Everybody you've ever met is an, is an image bearer. God has, there's so much potential out there. And yet, you know, I know, uh, the news reminds us, it's a jacked up world. So it's a corrupt world. 
And so the idea is that God has given us potential to become who he's created us to be. But because we're selfish, because we make things about ourselves, we worship ourselves, right? Uh, And we worship things other than God. um, We get corrupted. And so chances are you haven't arrived. You you either need to become more like him or there's some areas of your life that you need to... uh, avoid the corruption that the world offers. And that's what his promises offer us uh, in his word. Here's the cool thing about God's promises. He always keeps them. How many of you have promised someone, spouse, kids, uh, whoever, and, and you promised somebody something, but then you didn't, you didn't make good on that promise. You broke the promise. That's a rhetorical question. I appreciate the participation, but the answer is all of us, okay? Or you're a liar. One of the two. So uh, all of us have broken promises, every single one of us, and, and God always keeps his promises. This is, this is Exodus 6. We're going to jump off with verse 2, and, and here's what it says. God says to Moses, I'm the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the Lord, did not make myself fully known. I didn't make myself fully known to these guys. What is he talking about? So he's like, listen, I've had a covenant since Abraham. I'm the God of, of all these generations and I've revealed myself. We've had encounters. I've showed myself in some ways, but I really haven't made myself fully known by my name. And the Bible tells us that the way that God makes himself fully known is in Jesus. So Jesus is the culmination of all that God wants to say. Uh, Colossians 1, that's what it says, tells us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, that God was pleased to dwell and have his fullness in Jesus. You want to know what Jesus has to say? You want to know what God has to say? Look at Jesus. You want to know how uh, God wants us to live? Look at Jesus. You want to know what God teaches, what God's about, where his heart is? The Bible tells us it's on full display in Christ. And yet all the way back in Exodus 6, God says to Moses and to his people, I want to reveal some, some more things about my character, about my heart, and about my promises for you. And so he's like, I've, I've done some, we've done some cool things. It's been great. Read your Bible back through Genesis uh, and see all the cool things that God's done in the ways that he's revealed himself to his people. But he says, I got some new things to teach you, some new things to show you. And so look at verses 4 and 5. It starts off with this. He said, I established my covenant with them, talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them the land of Canaan, to give them the promised land where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I've heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Oh, that's good. I I want him to, when I'm going through a hard thing, when I'm in a space where I don't know what to do, when I'm having a struggle, when I'm broken, when bad things are happening to me, man, I really love it. I want him to remember his covenant. And so that's what happens if in, back in chapter two, people are groaning, they're crying, they're, and they're going, man, we are at the end of ourselves. And God, God hears their cry, remembers his covenant, and it sets into motion all that takes place throughout the rest of the book of Exodus. And so God's promises are made because of a covenant. That's why he gives us promises, because we have a covenant. Covenant is a blending of law and love. It's about a relationship, but it's also about like an agreement, a commitment to. That's what a covenant is about. When we step into marriage, that's what we step into, a covenant. And God said, I want you to have, I want to have a covenant relationship with you. I'm going to make promises to you, and I'm always going to make good on those promises. Why? Because his commitment is to his word. So it's not subject uh, to me and you and our behavior or our ability to keep our end of the bargain because we don't. His, his promises aren't subject to your circumstances. His promises are just a commitment to his own word. Look at 2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 22. It says, For now, how, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ, and so through him the amen is spoken to us by the glory of God. Which means... God gives promises and Jesus comes and fulfills and is the culmination of every promise that God has ever given. And because of Jesus, the promises are always yes and amen. Not because of your behavior, not because of your good deeds, not because you're a good person, not because you read your Bible. Jesus is the reason why it's always yes and amen. Now it's God who makes both us And you stand firm in Christ. He anoints us. He set his seal of ownership on us. He put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit. And he guarantees what's to come. You want to know how the promises get fulfilled? Because God wants them to, God wants to fulfill them. Not because we're good. Not because we deserve it. But because he's at work in us. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many promises. 
And there's a lot of them in the text. He always makes good on his promises. Um, I don't like making promises because it like locks me in and I'm not good at keeping them if I'm being real. So like my kids have learned from an early age and I've gotten wiser the, oh, the, the, the more that I've been in dad mode. Uh, but like kids would used to come to me like, dad, can I go over to so-and-so's house? Can I spend the night at so-and-so's house? And I was like, I don't care. Sure. Whatever. And they were like, you promise? And I'm like, okay, whatever. And then when it didn't work out, they come, you promised, you promised me. You know what I mean? Like, hey, dad, can I eat ice cream, you know, for dinner? Sure, I don't care, whatever. You promise, right? Dad, can I get a puppy? You promise? And anytime I would promise not make good on that promise, they're downloading that and going, okay, dad doesn't keep his promises. So I, I did away with that entirely. And I learned a new, a new way to live, which is, dad, can I do X, Y, Z? And I say, we'll see. We're going to leave it up to the Lord. It's a prophetic thing. Like, we'll see what the Lord does. You know what I mean? Or I use this one, go ask your mother, uh, which is equally prophetic. So, so, it's, so I'm just like, I just rid myself of the promise because I don't want to let my kids down and I don't want the narrative to be, dad doesn't keep his promises. Dad doesn't even give promises, okay? Let's just stop giving promises that we can't keep because all of us are garbage at it. But God is so good at it that everything that he promises in the book of Exodus comes to fulfillment. Everything we're going to talk about, all the promises that God gives. Look at Joshua 21, 45. Not a single one of the good promises that the Lord had given to, his, given to the family of Israel was left unfulfilled. What? Everything he had spoken came true. Everything. He always fulfills his promises. Even when it doesn't look like he is, he is. Even when it's not on your timeline, he is. Even when you have to wait, he is. Even when your expectation doesn't align with his promises, he's still faithful to fulfill his promises. Here's what Hebrews says about how God keeps his promises in Hebrews 6, 17 through 18. It says, when God wanted to guarantee his promises, what does he do? He gave his word. A rock solid guarantee. God can't break his word. He can't break it. And because his word cannot change, the promise is likewise unchangeable. If you can get God to commit to it, if you can get God to promise it, ooh, count it. Take it to the bank. Cash it in. It's happening, right? He said it. Oh, he said it, right? So it, he says, we who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab hold to the promised hope with both hands and never let go. I love that, which means that you and I, a big part of our job in following Jesus, a big part of our job in this life and this journey of growing in Christ and looking more like who God wants us to become is grabbing hold of the promises of God and then trusting him as we grab hold of the promises of God. And then in doing that, it actually helps us to become who he wants us to become, which is the whole Christian life. Matter of fact, let me say it this way. If you're here and you are not into becoming, if you're here and you're not into changing or growth or personal, like really just taking new levels, you are going to hate following Jesus because that is always only what he requires us to do, which is putting off the old self, putting on Christ always requires a little bit of discomfort, a little bit of awkward, a little bit of putting myself out there in vulnerability, but it always gives me over to more. Always. And it's always by grabbing hold of the promises that he's given to me and to you. That's what he's teaching us in his word. And so in this text, in, Ephes excuse me, in Exodus 6, um, he sets it up. God says, hey, there's a covenant. Now remember my covenant. And so Moses, I know you're having a bad day. I know everybody hates you right now. I know Pharaoh doesn't want to listen. I know the Israelites are after you. I'm just telling you there's four things I'm going to do. Write these things down. And so here's the four promises that he gives the people of Israel. He gives them to me and you as well. Verse 6, God says, therefore say to the Israelites, I'm the Lord. And he, so he, he bookends the promises by starting off by saying, I'm God. You want to know how these things are going to play out? I'm God. I'm the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So the first thing that God promises is salvation. God promises me, you, salvation as his people. And so we think salvation, sometimes if we're not careful, we think of salvation from, uh, from a religious standpoint. Like it's a religious offering of some sort. It's being a good person. I'm going to be saved if I'm a good person. No, that's wrong. I, I'm going to attend church. I'm going to show up. I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ride the faith of my parents. I'm going to do the things. I'm going to do all the things. Check all the boxes. Salvation is just a revelation of who your God is. When he says, I am the Lord, listen, 
the moment of salvation is the moment you realize who you are in relationship to who Jesus is. Anybody that has ever experienced that, a full surrender to him, realize you just get to a broken place, you are humbled, and you finally see Jesus, and you go, you just surrender. You go, I need a Savior. I need a Lord. I cannot do this. I can't save myself. I can't live this life on my own. Everything that you're about, your life, your death, your resurrection, the future hope that I have is in your finished work, not in mine. And so, but it's, it's a moment where you meet him. You just meet him. That's your personal salvation. Everything necessary for everybody's salvation happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus finished that. But your personal salvation is when you just realize it. You see Jesus for who he is. And so God promises that, God promises us that salvation. The question is, how do we know if we've experienced that promise? And the Bible gives us filters, one of which is in John 17. So Jesus is praying this prayer right before he goes to the cross, right before he dies. And he's praying for his followers. He's praying for me and you, praying for his disciples, praying for his followers. And he prays this prayer in John 17. And he says this word. Here's what he says. This is eternal life, that they know you. This is salvation, that they know you. This is your future hope that you know him not know about him that you know him you have a relationship with him god he says the one true god and jesus whom you have sent that you would know me and so jesus he's focused on you got to think jesus is praying this prayer and he's beginning to pray this prayer he's praying it out loud he's praying it for himself to remind him hey here's what the next few hours are about here's what me laying my life is like laying my life down is about here's what me all these jokers, all these fools are going to leave me. Betray me. They're going to deny me. People are going to publicly mock me. They're going to beat me. The Bible tells us un, like he was unrecognizable in the way that they beat him. And then he lays his life down, dies the death that you and I deserve. Why? So that they may know you. And so he's reminding himself in that moment. That's what all this is about. Man, that they would know you. Salvation looks like a relationship with God. It's not a relationship with the church, which is important. But if you think your eternity is based off of your relationship with, you, with the church or your attendance or you're showing up to a thing, showing up is really important because it can get on you. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying you, like, it's a relationship. We've got to have a personal relationship. You have to know him. There's a sobering passage of scripture where Jesus reminds the people in front of me. He's like, listen, there's going to come a day in eternity where people step into eternity and, uh, and they have this moment. Where uh, a moment of judgment and a moment of stepping into their future fate. And, and they're going to look at me and say, Lord, I did all these things in your name. I did all these things. I, I cast out demons in your name. And I served. And I went on a mission trip. And I read my Bible twice. And I, and I did all these things in your name. And he's going to say, I didn't know you. I didn't know you. So the difference is, is it knowing things about him or is it actually knowing him? And so, some of the things like your prayer life, what does that look like? Do you talk to him? Do you hear him? Do you listen to him? Do you spend time in his word? It's not even, it's not even a, uh, it, it's not on you. It's, it's, a, it's a relationship. Have you had a moment, have you had an encounter where you go, I know I've met him. I know I've met him. But it doesn't end there. So that's just where it starts. The first promise is about salvation. And the second promise um, is, is a different one. He says this, I will free you from being uh, slaves to them. So I'm going to bring you out of Egypt and then I'm going to free you from being slaves to them, which sounds redundant. It sounds like the same thing. When I first read it, I was like, that's the same thing. It's double freedom is what we have. And it, but that's not, that's not what he's saying. Um, being brought out and being freed from my slavery, slavery to sin is not the same thing. There's a lot of us who are free in Christ, but we still act like slaves. Let me say this. There's a lot of us who, um, we've been brought out of Egypt, but there's so much Egypt right here. Right? And so it's just our, you can, you can experience Christ. Here's the frustrating thing about following Jesus in the Christian life. People come to faith in Christ, and then there's no sanctifying work taking place. There's no submission to surrender in all areas of life to Jesus. And so you get frustrated because you're like, man, I love Jesus. I love his life, his death, and his resurrection. Woo! empty tomb let's go and then you still struggle with the same things you prayed about it last week you're like lord i'm so tired of struggling with the same things and then you did it five more times this week and you're like i cannot how do i and and, and it's because he wants to free you from your predispositions to sin and struggle struggling with the same broken stuff and so what he's teaching us in this part of the passage god's promise uh he promises us deliverance 
So not only does he promise us salvation, but God promises us deliverance. And so um, deliverance is for people. Deliverance is kind of a scary word, but deliverance is really just for people who are trapped in their old habits, old life, old struggles, even though they believe, even though they've experienced salvation, just have a tendency to go back to the way it was, the way I was just comfortable like that. And this is a theme in the book of Exodus because God literally delivers his people. Crazy miracles, plagues, parting the sea. They're standing on the other side of the sea. The Egyptians are drowning. They sing a worship song. Three days later, they're walking around in the wilderness like, oh my God, I'm so thirsty. Yo, oh, I'm hungry. This is so stupid, Moses. What are you doing? Why'd you bring us out here? Read it. It's in the text. They're complaining about being delivered because they don't have, they're like, we had it better in Egypt, morons. This is what we do. This is what we do. We experience Christ, and then three days later, we're like, oh, I don't know, man. I don't know. Like, it's, so we go back to our old ways. We go back to what's comfortable. We go back to whatever, whatever we knew before. We go back to it, and this is what happens. Time, it's, it's not new. This is Exodus 3,000 years ago. People are still doing the same things. Um, and so just to encourage you, following Jesus is a lifetime of um, deliverance. So some people think, and this is the problem with kind of our modern approach to the Christian faith. We only like deliverance. We like deliverance. We just want our testimony to be like from 15 years ago. Not yesterday. Right? Let's be real for a minute. I don't want to talk about the junk I had to deal with this week. I want to talk about what God delivered me from 15 years ago. Like he only delivered me from stuff from 15 years ago. And, and what we do is we rob everybody around us of the opportunity to realize that, man, following Jesus is a lifetime of deliverance. Just like following Jesus is a lifetime of getting to know him better, following Jesus is a lifetime of me putting off my old self and then stepping into more of Christ. It doesn't just happen one time. You're like, well, I don't struggle with that anymore. Like, God, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm God freed me from that. Awesome. There are plenty of other things you're going to get freed from. Uh, trust me. That's great. You don't drink anymore. Great. There'll be other things you need to be freed from. Great. You don't do cocaine anymore. There'll be other things you need to be freed from. You don't struggle with lust. You don't struggle with like whatever. There'll be other things that you need to be freed from. I promise you it is a lifetime of, of following him. And uh, it doesn't just happen one time. It happens, it happens all the time. I, we, confession time. Okay. So we were on a plane yesterday. We were coming back, me and Brooke and some of our team. We went to a church conference this week. It was awesome. It was great. Got filled up. You know what I mean? Uh, there, was, there was a point. Uh, Carrie Job and Cody Carnes were leading worship. We're in an arena. They're singing the blessing. You know what I mean? I'm pretty sure I saw an angel. It was awesome. And it was just like, I was like, oh, man, it's great. God, you just filled me up. I was excited to come back. You know, I'm just excited. Bring, bring, bring the team back. And we get off this plane. And we're getting off the plane. Uh, it, it's just that moment where everybody kind of lines up and each row goes out. Proper plane etiquette is for every single row to go out, you know, and then you wait on the next row and the people in front of you let them off first. And so that moment's happening. Everybody's getting off the plane. It gets our turn and, and, and people just start walking. Like, they keep walking. And I'm like, these rows are not, you know what I mean? We're trying to get off the plane. You know how everybody gets a little antsy when the plane... It's like, you're not that important. Where do you have to go? Like, everyone is like, they're like, you know, they're, they're, trying, they're getting the bags and they're like in a rush. And everybody's like, so everybody's in a rush. and Everybody's like trying to tackle each other to get off the plane. And, uh, and that moment's taking place and we're trying to let everybody leave. But my grace has its limitations. You know what I mean? And so it's like people are walking past me and it's like four, five, six, seven. I said, ho. I said, ho. I literally said that. So I was like, we got to stop the flow uh, at some point. We got to stop the flow. And, and I'm looking because there's people across from me on, my, on our team and people behind me. And I grab our bags. I grab my bag, grab Brooke's bag, and I slam it down. Because I just want people to know. I'm for real. You know what I mean? So stupid. Like, I'm angry. Like, I'm, I'm so immature. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, she just slam it down. And, and I'm wearing a Jesus hat, by the way, like from the conference. <laughs> and, and the stewardess looks at me, God looks at me, and he's like, sir, calm down. And I wanted to say... Do your job. But I didn't say that. In my flesh, I, I felt it. Like I was, and I was like, oh, so angry. And uh, Brooke, <laughs> Brooke, who's more mature in the faith than I am, she looked at me later. She was like, what was that? <laughs> and it's just like, that happened yesterday. 
And that was the G-rated version of what I'm going to share on this platform for what God's revealed to me recently in my own flesh. I'm telling you that finding freedom and being delivered is a lifetime of following Jesus. It is not, I have a testimony of what God did 20 years ago. Baloney. You need to have a testimony of what God did yesterday and the day before and last week and last month. And, and the people who are, who are secure enough and mature enough in their faith are just willing. There's just things that we don't share. Things that we're ashamed of and real, real obedience and real maturity in Christ. He'll bring us to a place one day. I promise this will happen. As we follow Jesus, he'll bring us to a place where the things that we used to be ashamed of, the things that we felt like, man, that's too vulnerable, that's too dark, I'm too ashamed of that. God will give you freedom and deliverance in those things, and those will be the things that you boast about. Your weakness. And some of you, it got real quiet because you're all like, oh, Jesus, he's going after it today. But I promise you, it, 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 it's not a now thing. I'm just telling you, he'll, as you follow him, as you grab hold of his promises, he'll, he'll deliver you. And it, and, and, and it should encourage us that there's a biblical precedent, too. There's other people in Scripture that tell us, hey, this is a lifetime thing. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7 and 8, this is the guy who writes two-thirds of the New Testament. You think you're great at following Jesus. You're not. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Okay, knows his Bible better than any of us, planted more churches, persecuted, beaten, all that kind of stuff in the name of Jesus. And he tells us in Romans 7 and 8, hey, the things that I really want to do, I can't do them. And the things that I, man, the things I don't want to do, I end up doing those things. And he's like, I, God, I need you to help me to become who you want me to become. And then he says this in Romans 7, verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. Like I know the right thing. I know that I, what I want to ascend to. I know the right answer. And he says this, but in my sinful nature, I'm a, sl- I'm a sin to the, I'm a slave to the law of sin. I can't help myself. Then he says this in chapter 8. This should encourage us. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. He says, listen, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, you have your future hope in his finished work, not your ability to keep the law because you can't. That's kind of the point. But there's no condemnation. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. John John 3, 17. So he he didn't come to condemn. He came so that he could save. And Paul references that. There's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, through Christ, Jesus, the law of uh, the spirit who gives us life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. How do we find freedom? How do we find deliverance? How do we actually put off the old self? How do we finally stop whatever it is that we're struggling with? Through Christ. Not your willpower. Not your own strength. Not, I'm finally going to get it together. I'm going to get it together. No, you won't. You won't get it together. Through Jesus, Paul tells us, hey, Jesus saves. Jesus delivers. He's the means by which all this work takes place. God's not condemning you in your sin. He's inviting you to let go of old ways through Jesus. Through Jesus. And so who gives life, he sets you free from sin and death. And so how do I get brought out? How do I experience salvation? Jesus. How do I find freedom? Jesus. And by his spirit, he's going to show you areas that are inconsistent with who he is and then give you over to the power. He gives you the power and then the courage of conviction. He actually gives you the boldness to be able to change your life. You're like, what do I bring to the table? Nothing. Just, you, I mean, you show up and you have to trust him. You have to grab hold of his promises. You have to actually lean in. But, it's, I mean, it's him doing all the work on the inside of you as he changes you. Paul tells us it's a lifetime thing. It's not something that happens once. There's enough Egypt in me to last a lifetime. And I could, I could, listen, here's what I know. The, the older I get and the more I follow Jesus, the more I realize how much is there. So for those of us who think we're, we've arrived, you are so far away. For those of us who realize how much is there to work on, how much I need to be freed from myself, you're getting closer. Right? So the more you realize, man, this is God's got so much to do in my life, you're getting a little bit closer. Here's the encouraging thing. Proverbs 24 tells us that a righteous man isn't somebody uh, who never falls. A righteous man is someone who falls seven times and gets up seven times. So it's not that you're never going to fall. You will fall. (laughs) You're going to make decisions, say things, do things, think things. You're going to go places. Because of your humanity and brokenness, you're going to fall. Guess what? Righteous man gets up seven times. 
confess, repent, turn. God, help me to see where I missed the mark. Invite the right people in my life who are for me. There's grace. There is forgiveness. There is healing. There is hope. And I get up seven times. That is good news. Free you from being slaves is what he promises to do. And so um, there's two other promises. It gets better. So he promises to bring us out, salvation. He promises to deliver us, and he wants to, um, he wants to help us to find freedom. But he also, look at this next part. He says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will redeem you. And redeem is churchy's word, is, but, but like it's a biblical word, but it just means to put back to my original intent. It means that he wants to restore me. So God promises me restoration. He promises me salvation and deliverance, but he also promises me restoration. So he wants to redeem my life, which means he had an original plan for my life. And somewhere along the way, I'm off track. I'm not living the purpose for which I was called. I'm not living the original intent for which I was created. And the Bible tells us uh, all about this. Ephesians 1, 11 and 12. It's in Christ. Again, there's the answer. It's going to be the answer every time, by the way, Jesus. But it's in Jesus that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Jesus and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us had designs on us for his glorious living and part of the overall purpose he's working out in everything and everyone before you were born before you were aware of yourself before you had plans and passions and you're like i'm going to be an astronaut jesus had a call on your life a plan for your life a purpose for your life and his is better than whatever you've dreamed up for yourself And so part of restoration part of redemption is just surrendering your agenda to his agenda Because you were created on purpose and for a purpose. One of the most meaningful moments of my life was when God spoke through a lady that I didn't even really know, didn't have very little context, walked across the church lobby. I was in a broken season, humbled season, really jacked up, just kind of ashamed and just, just, just kind of shrinking as a human. And, um, and, and in this woman's prayer life and in her quiet time, there's a whole nother message, but in her quiet time, she's just like, God speaks to her and says, Hey, I want you to go say this to this guy. We didn't know each other. She walks across the lobby, put herself out there, high risk situation. You look like a moron when you do this, right? So she walks across and she's like, Hey, I just want to let you know, like God spoke to me the other night. I was praying and he wanted me to tell you he's going to do great things through you. That was it. It wasn't specific at all. That was all she got wrecked me. And I was like, what? It's, first of all, I was like, you're crazy. This is a crazy lady. And then she leaned in more, grabbed my arm. She's like, no, God's going to do great things through you. And there was no specifics. She didn't tell me any of the things. All she did was just deliver whatever God wanted her to deliver in that moment. And she just said, hey, there is an op- there's, his plan is to redeem you. And his plan is to restore you. That's really all she said to me. And it broke me in the best way possible. And it gave me over to purpose. And it gave me over to vision. And it gave me over to joy. It gave me over to like... He's not done. And I just want to tell you, wherever you're at in this room, God can restore you. God can redeem you. And God can set you right in the middle of the original purpose and the call that he had for your life. He's outside of time. Some of you are like, I'm too old. No, you're not. We serve a God who's outside of time. He will leverage every bit of all the things that you pursued, all the things that you missed the mark, everything broken and weak in your past. And he will leverage all that for for your good and his glory. He will just put purpose on it. You do, but you do have to at some point surrender it and go, am I missing out on my purpose? Am I missing out on being redeemed, on being restored? Because his promise is that he will do that. I will redeem you. And listen, with an outstretched arm with mighty acts of judgment. He's like, listen, you think, you think that there's things that you've done, places that you've gone that are they're too far. He's like, you don't understand. That's how I'm working. I'm going to take the things that you felt like were too far gone, the things that were too weak, the things that were too broken, and in my power and in my outstretched arm, that's how I work. You, you don't have a weak testimony. You have a strong testimony as long as you're willing to surrender the things that you thought he could never work in. That's too dark. That's too far gone. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I, can't, I, can't be, I can't be honest. I can't share. I can't open up. I can't tell people... Like he's like, no, you don't understand. That's where I'm working. That's how I, that's how I work. So he redeems us. I love it so much. He has a unique call on every single person in this room. 
Uh, this is what we talk about as a church all the time is that you and I are a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And when I actually surrender my life to Christ and his agenda, he reveals to me passions and strengths and context. And I, I stop focusing on other people's lanes. I stop focusing on what other people are graced to do. And I focus on what I'm graced to do. And that's where I fully come alive in my purpose. Not what is everybody else doing? I got to do what everybody else is doing. No, I got to do what God's called me to do to the, like, the most obedient that I can be in what God's called me to do. And then, boom, he just breathes on it. And it's just crazy. He gives us over. But it's only found in the context of something greater than us. Look at the last. This is the last promise. He says this. He says, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. I'll bring you out of Egypt. I'll free you as slaves. Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment and then I'm going to take you as my own people and I'll be your God and so this last promise I love it because it shifts this vernacular shifts from I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring you out and I'm going to deliver you and and I'm going to redeem you and the last one he says I'm gonna make you my people and following Jesus is only done in the context of together you can't do it. You can't follow God. You can't listen. There's a reason why God moves and he calls a people. He calls a people. He doesn't call a person. He calls a people. And, and, you know, individuals are a part of that story and a part of that narrative, but it's always about what God's doing in the people of God. If you want to look more like Jesus, you got to get people around you. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because you came here on Sunday, but it's not just enough to like attend a service and have superficial hellos and be like, cool, bye. I've come once, you know, every three weeks or whatever. It's like you have to dig in and like get it on you. You got to get people in your corner, people praying for you, people knowing your junk, people coming alongside of you and believing you, people forgiving you, extending grace, people allowing. You have to do the messy work of together. That's the only way to do it is to be found in the context of community. The final stage of God's design for your life and the promise that he has for us he doesn't just remake you as a person he remakes us as a people that's the final stage and so that's what we're called to becoming a part of a family of God becoming a part of his team I'm not talking about just Soma, Big C Church I'm talking about the whole thing people who worship Jesus globally people who would take what is biblical and go I, I surrender to that like, I'm talking about that on a mass scale what God is doing globally is so much bigger than what he's doing in, just in my life and so it feels good to be a part of a family. It feels good to be a part of a team that makes a difference. And that's what we want for everybody in our church is the last promise. God's promises, he promises me fulfillment. So he promises me salvation and deliverance and restoration, but he also promises me fulfillment. Because if you've ever, if you've ever, if you've ever done something, he, here's what he wants us to do. He wants us to get our focus off of ourselves. You want fulfillment? Stop thinking about yourself. And this is all we ever do in Western culture. Social media doesn't help. Like our, our, the time in which we live, it doesn't help. But man, what is the biblical mandate is others. Others. <laughs> the one another's in the room so that you can reach the others who are outside of the room. Just make it about others. You want a better marriage? Others. You want to lead your family? You want your kids to grow up in a great? Others. You want a better work culture? Think about how you can serve the other people at work. You want better friendships? Don't think about yourself. Think about your friends. Even check the motivations for why you say what you say when you say it. Here's something I'm learning. Is this for me as I say it? Is this to fluff my feathers, make me feel good posture? Am I angling? Am I trying to flex on people in this moment? Or am I actually serving people with my words? Because if I'm not, shut up. I'm talking to myself, okay? I'm just saying, like, these are things that I'm thinking. Is this about me or is this about other people? Because I get to be fulfilled in the way that I serve others. This is what Jesus models. This is his life. This is his mandate. You want to be great? Lay your life down. It's the opposite of what the world teaches. It's the polar opposite. It's so countercultural that it's like the rest, I mean, everything is baked into us that it's about you. Get your house, your career, your job, your click, whatever. Join the club. I mean, you're like, do separate yourselves from the pack, stand apart, all that kind of stuff. And the Bible is, hey, serve others. 
Find yourself in a part of a community and a family of God and then find your place and then watch what happens as you serve together collectively and you, you each use your gifts. You have strengths I don't have. You have a mission field and a context that I don't have. There's people that you can reach and serve better than anybody else in this room. No one can reach and serve the people in your life, your sister, your brother, your, I mean, your cousin, the people you work with in the same way that the people in this room. You, you can do it better than any of us. And, and you're positioned to do it. And there's things that you're passionate about, things that you're good at, that you're better. I mean, you're, you're called to do it. You're called to do it. And ultimate fulfillment is finding ourselves in what God's doing. Here's how he ends the passage. This is the end of this, this, uh, this part in chapter 6. After the promises, he says, Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. He says, uh, so he starts off with saying, um, I will bring you out. And, but what he's teaching us in this passage of scriptures, all the pr- promises are really, they, they just reveal more of who God is. And when, we're, when we grab hold of them and we're actually obedient to do what he's asking us to do, the passage tells us, hey, you're going to fully know me when you Surrender your life. Come to know me. You find some freedom. You discover the purpose for which you were called. You you root yourself, not in your own agenda, but in my agenda for you. You find yourself as a part of the family of God. Then you will know that I'm the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. He says this, and I'll bring you to the land that I swore with an uplifted hand to give to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I'll give it to you as a possession. And then he ends he ends his part with promises. He started with, I am the Lord, and then he ends with, I am the Lord. And, uh, and I love it because what he says is he says, hey, all of these, a, a part of all of these promises is so that I can lead you ultimately to the land that I've created for you. I promised it. And you and I as followers of Christ have an eternity that waits, that is just waiting on us to run that and then step into the promise that God has for us, a place that Jesus has gone and prepared for us, not just a future hope and eternity, but the abundant life that Jesus claims that if we do this now, you don't have to wait till you die. You can actually experience the kingdom of heaven now if we do this. And you're not going to be perfect and you're going to make mistakes. And, and, and the Christian mandate is grace and forgiveness and you're going to need it. You're going to need to extend it. You're going to need to receive it. But as we march towards him, man, we get to experience and know him more. So my question for all of us is today is like where you're at in your faith. Exodus 6 reveals to us the heart of God. He wants to save you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to restore you. He wants to give you fulfillment. But you, all we have to do is grab hold of the promises and trust him in those promises. It's hard. I know it's hard. But just as we pray right here, as we close out the service, just think about where you're at. Where am I at in all those promises? What am I leaving on the table? Jesus paid for all of it. What am, I, what am I not taking, what am I not grabbing hold of? Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much for the way that you love us. Thank you for uh, your life and for your death and for your resurrection. And thank you that you are, um, man, you're an image of the invisible God. And in you, he was pleased to have his fullness dwell. And if we want to know what God looks like, we just look at you. But God, you teach us uh, in your word all throughout scripture that you have promises for every single person in this room. And you also teach us that you keep, you are, you're faithful in ways that we're not, ways that we stop short. Man, we just can't keep our word, but you can. So you make promises and commit to yourself, to your own word on our behalf and on, for our benefit. Not because we're good, not because we deserve it, not because we can actually uh, do anything about it, but because (laughs) you just love us. And so, because of your love, um, man, our our response ought to be surrender. We ought to surrender our lives. And so, um, I pray that you would give us over to the courage of conviction to do that today, in whatever area that looks like. If you're here today and you have never seen or experienced Jesus for who he is, you don't know him known things about him but you never really stepped into a personal relationship with him and you want to surrender your life today i want to give you an opportunity to do that Um, it's your faith in jesus that saves you 
It's that moment where you actually surrender your life to him and you see him for who he is and you go all in. You go all in. You say, Jesus, I surrender. I surrender my life. I love you. I'm so grateful for you. If you're here today and you would love to surrender your life to Jesus and, and, um, and come to faith in him, I would love to give you an opportunity to do that. Just right where you sit, just raise your hand and just say, that's me. Just the boldness, the courage of conviction right where you sit. If there's one person in the room, you're just like, that's me today. Yeah, just pray this prayer right where you're at. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. Man, I, I lay it down. I grab hold of that promise. I grab hold of the promise that you'll bring me out and that you've done everything necessary for that. And now, God, give us all over to a place of deliverance. For those of us who struggle with unconfessed sin, for those of us who have certain habits that we know, we just keep hitting our head up against the same wall. And for those of us who just have, uh, man, things that we're ashamed of, things that we would never say out loud, things that we need to be freed from, things that have been done to us, things we've done to ourselves. God, you want us to have deliverance in those areas. Give us over to that. And then for, all of, for everybody who's here, God, we just miss all the time purpose. So help us to see exactly what you've called us to do. Give us over to passions and dreams and, and a call and a conviction in our lives. It just gives us over to great purpose, which always looks like, always looks like the fulfillment we find of being a part of what you're building. Not our agenda, but your agenda. Help us to see that. By your spirit, by your word, give us over to that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.